welcome everyone to episode 28, Remastered. Today, I'll be discussing the next era in the evolutionary history of life on Earth. I started with the vast expanse of time that was the Precambrian Eon, which took us to the Cambrian Explosion, where animal life underwent dramatic diversification. This began the Paleozoic Era, which included the Age of Fish, and as life adapted to dry land, we went through the Mesozoic Era, which included the dinosaurs and the Age of Reptiles. If you just got done listening to the last episode, you should remember that the Mesozoic Era came to a climactic end with the impact of a huge asteroid 66 million years ago. This impact and the following ash cloud choked the planet and blocked out the sun, killing most of the plants, as well as most of the dinosaurs, most of the marine creatures, and many other species of land-dwelling animal. The world was left barren and empty, and all of the ash in the sky that blocked out the sun kept the world cold and dark. But this period of desolation eventually passed. The ash cleared from the sky, and the sun was able to warm the earth once more. This began a new age called the Cenozoic Era. It's a period that lasted from 66 million years ago up until the present day, and it is currently ongoing as we speak. The Cenozoic Era is split into three parts, called the Paleogene, the Neogene, and the Quaternary Periods. During the early Paleogene, at the very beginning of the Cenozoic Era, the world's biota was recovering. Ecosystems were reforming, and various species were undergoing adaptive radiations to fill all of the open niches in the new ecosystems. As most of the dinosaurs on land and in the oceans had gone extinct, this made room for the mammals and the birds and for other groups to come in and fill the void. In the oceans, all of the reptilian predators, like the ichthyosaurs, had been wiped out and predators like the sharks and crocodiles stepped up to become the new apex marine predators. On land, small mammals like creodonts and the early primates would become ubiquitous in many places across the world. All of these creatures were small, as the largest mammals, reptiles, and amphibians were all wiped out in the KT extinction. These small creatures spread out into a massive world. The plants didn't sit idly by in this time period either. The plants really continued their dominance of the Earth, taking advantage of the rising heat to expand across the planet, especially in the mid-Paleogene when global temperatures had risen significantly and the world was swamped in jungle. By the time the ecosystems of the world had fully recovered, the surviving species had already radiated and speciated quite a number of times. While mammals still hadn't gotten much larger than 10 or 15 kilograms, they had begun to diverge into a number of distinct groups. Primates were becoming more varied in the jungles across the world, as were ungulates like horses and goats, and the recent ancestors of the whales began to move back into the oceans. Of all the animal species on the planet right now, the largest and most fearsome were the birds the descendants of the dinosaurs who just insisted on keeping their family legacy going for a little bit longer. Various species of birds could be carnivorous and predatory, or they could be herbivorous. The predatory birds feasted on the huge selection of tiny reptiles and mammals that were now available to them, plucking rodents off the ground and yanking primates out of trees. Some would dive into the water to catch fish, or merely fly down and swoop their claws under the surface of the water to grab an unlucky fish who happened to be swimming nearby. Many species of these birds were enormous, with some, like the diatrima or the gastornis, standing more than two meters tall. The gastornis was a flightless bird, similar in many respects to the ostriches of today. But unlike modern ostriches, The Gastornis had a massively thick beak and a heavy skull, and all of this was mounted on a very thick neck, on legs of thick bones ending in talon-toed feet. So they're like the ostrich's larger, meaner, more vicious older brother. But despite their ferocious appearance, 
there's debate over whether or not these birds were actually carnivores. The traditional idea was that these huge birds would have had to have been predatory, no doubt feasting on the numerous small mammals that roamed around. Things like the carnivorous creodonts or the omnivorous primates, all of whom were at the time no more than 10 kilograms or about 22 pounds, all of these little creatures would have been easy picking for a giant bird. Furthermore, studies of the Gastornis skull have found that it was evolutionarily designed to be able to provide a hugely powerful bite, which supports the idea that the Gastornis was a predatory bird able to break the bones of its prey. Although others have argued that Gastornis was an omnivore, or even an herbivore, because it's lacked a few telltale features of predatory birds. For instance, it didn't have a hooked beak. In predatory birds, the beak features a sharp hook at the tip, which is ideal for ripping flesh, for holding under prey, or for attacking a competing raptor. But the fossils of the Gastornis don't have this hook on the beak. Also, its powerful bite could have been used to open seeds just as easily as it could have been used to snap a bone. And with the continent-covering jungles of the time, it isn't really that unreasonable to think that there might have been a few tough seeds that Gastornis would crack open for food. As if to put the issue to rest, there have been recent studies on calcium isotopes in the Gastornis fossils that have found that they almost certainly didn't have meat in their diet, and instead they ate the leaves and the shoots of plants, like many of their dinosaur ancestors. There's another clade of large birds called the forest rackids, or the terror birds. These things were just as tall, if not taller, than the Gastornis, and they unambiguously possessed all of the hallmarks of an apex predator. First, the forest rackids had the hooked beak distinctive of a bird of prey. Their 18-inch long beaks were tipped with a downward curving growth that was like a knife, used to slice and rip at the flesh of their prey. Their necks were really flexible and muscular, capable of striking out at incredible speed. Combined with their heavy, bony head, the force of the forest rackids lunging out to bite at you would have been tremendous. They would break bone before they even closed their jaws. For most of the small creatures that were alive at the time, a forest rackid strike would have been instant death. These terror birds even had powerful legs, so they could run quickly but they weren't particularly agile. If you were a small Cenozoic era mammal, you might be able to outrun the forest rackid, if you were agile enough. But if you weren't, if the forest rackid caught you, it would hold you down with a foot sharp with talons, while pecking at your flesh with its razor beak until you bled to death. The morphology of their beak suggests that they didn't try to shake their prey to death, but instead they chose to slice and stab with incessant pecking motions. For all the little critters and primates hiding out in the dense forests and underbrush, these predator birds would have been existential terror incarnate. But it would be these humble mammals whose descendants would go on to become the dominant land predators. In the Paleogene, the creodonts had spread and adapted to many places in North America, as well as Eurasia and Africa. For much of the early Paleogene, the intense heat and extensive jungle habitat had kept mammal species somewhat small. But in time, all things must come to an end, and this was true for the planetary forests of the early Paleogene. The Earth underwent a cooling period as ocean currents began circulating cold water from the poles. This ambient cooling caused the jungles to recede, leaving behind new habitats like grasslands and temperate forests and prairie. The world literally opened up, allowing animals to run and graze across large expanses of open grassland, land that had previously been choked by trees and foliage. As life grows to fit its environment, this literal opening up of the landscape allowed animals to grow larger getting much bigger than their ancestors, who had just barely survived the KT extinction. The mammals went from a bunch of 20-pound tetrapods to become huge, lumbering beasts, similar in size to tigers, or elephants, or literally whales. Whales had really emerged into their own in the oceans, so much so that by the mid-Paleogene, 
They were competing with sharks for the position of top marine predator. Meanwhile, in the receding forests, the primates evolved the lineage of apes, which would go on to split into the great apes and the lesser apes. There was the mammalian Sarcastodon, a so-called hyperpredator that lived 35 million years ago. These creatures had massive hyena-shaped skulls, which would suggest that they were huge predators who hunted and killed other large mammals. The Sarcastodons most likely hunted the Calicotheres and the Brontotheres, which were grazing herbivores that grew to the size of horses. As it stands, both of these species were closely related to the ancestors of horses and rhinoceroses, and they shared many similarities with them. The Brontotheres, for example, had gray skin and horns like a rhinoceros, and they grazed on leaves and the shoots of plants. By the late Paleogene, the Creodonts began to get outcompeted by the Carnivorans, which were another emergent lineage of carnivorous mammal. The end of the Paleogene period saw the emergence of numerous species from these lineages of carnivora, including the wolves, the bears, the hyenas, and other big cats. Other species of mammal began to emerge as well, including the elephants and the marsupials. Many species of mammal came into existence only to go extinct a few million years later, like the Uintotheriidae, which looked kind of like a hippopotamus, as well as a possibly related group called the Mesonychia. Some of the other animals that emerged at the time were the Pantodonts, which appeared like strange bears that had really long necks, long tails, and long fur. And you also had the Intelodonts. The Intelodonts are really fascinating animals. They existed for about 21 million years during the late Paleogene, and they were basically giant primordial pig monsters, more closely related to whales than pigs, but taking the form of a huge and bulky pig. Mature adult Intelodonts stood nearly 7 feet tall at the shoulder, with a body weight that could have possibly exceeded a thousand pounds. They were engines of gluttonous destruction that would hunt and eat as many animals as they could, and complement their day's meal with an herbivorous plate of leaves, stems, and tubers. These Intelodonts earned the nickname Hell Pigs, or Terminator Pigs, because they were the top predators of their ecosystem. And yet, despite their intimidating size, these things had brains the size of a tennis ball. This is kind of like the dinosaurs of yesteryear, like the Brachiosaurus, with its huge tail and neck and towering legs, and brain the size of a walnut. Now the mammals weren't just the only species to radiate and speciate during the early Paleogene. The snakes, which had originated many millions of years earlier in the late Cretaceous, had survived the KT extinction and they were now, in the Paleogene, undergoing successive adaptive radiations. As a result, the snake populations exploded in size and variety, and they spread to almost all the corners of the world. The snakes were particularly adapted to the grasslands and the savannas that would become so common during this time period. In these grasslands and savannas, the snakes were the apex predators, because they could slither through the grass unseen able to sneak up and pounce on the various grassland rodents and uh, other creatures that also thrived in the drier habitats. Remember how back at the beginning of the Paleogene, the warming earth had become covered in dense jungle? All of this vegetation takes CO2 from the air. It takes CO2 for plants to grow. And so during summer, when plants are growing, CO2 is generally absorbed from the air, and the global CO2 levels drop ever so slightly. In the winter, leaves fall and plants decay, and the carbon returns to the atmosphere, so the CO2 level rises ever so slightly. These are small-scale fluctuations based on the seasons. But during the Paleogene, the formation of these huge forests had sucked a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And because CO2 is a greenhouse gas, its mass removal from the atmosphere and sequestration in vegetation encouraged the global cooling that would define much of the later Paleogene. 
But understand that this removal of CO2 wasn't the only factor that was at play here. Glaciation events that saw the formation of Antarctica would also cool the oceans, and the temperature gradients created currents. And through the currents, the cold water cycled through the Earth, and cooled both the air and the rest of the ocean water. This glaciation locked up water and sea ice, and this caused the sea levels to drop which increased the area of dry land and the climatic volatility of the intercontinental regions, because now they were farther away from the climate-moderating effects of the ocean water. All of this data coincides with several meteor impacts around 34 million years ago, which are thought to have contributed to the global cooling by throwing up ash and dust and blocking out the sun for a short period of time, kind of like a very mini version of the KT extinction. All of these environmental factors came to a head at the end of the Paleogene, 34 million years ago, and it created a strange but brief cold period that lasted for about half a million years. This period of sudden cold is believed to have brought along the Eocene-Oligocene extinction event, which was an extinction that took place in the later third of the Paleogene period. This extinction led to a subsequent event called the Grand Kapoor, or the Great Break. It's a reference to the perceived break in the continuity of the European mammal fauna, many of which seem to have died out during the extinction. Mammal species from Asia migrated westward into the emptied regions, which show up in the fossil record as a sudden explosion of Asian mammal lineages in the European fossil beds around this time period. Also during this time period, the giant birds like the forest racket and the gastornis slowly disappeared as they were outcompeted by other predators. After that brief extinction event, the Paleogene chugged along for another 10 million years or so before the start of the Neogene, which is the next period in the Cenozoic era. This period lasted about 20 million years, and it began about 23 million years ago. Although this period is relatively brief from an evolutionary perspective, a lot happened during the Neogene. It was a very fertile time for plants, as hundreds of new species emerged and radiated everywhere they could. Plants like grasses and kelps became common, each creating new environments that shaped the evolution of new animal species. For example, all of these kelp forests in these shallow marine areas provided the environment that led to the emergence of otters and the land grasses tended to push back the forests to create vast expanses of grassland that would become home to a plethora of grazing species. A lot of these grazing animals belong to an order called the Parasodactyla, but they're also known as the odd-toed ungulates. This order is composed of three lineages, the rhinoceros, the tapirs, and animals like horses and zebras. All of these animals find their ideal habitats in drier grasslands, where they can roam around these huge expanses of prairie, or savanna, or montane grassland, and graze on all of the local vegetation. All of these groups display the traits of herbivores, like canine teeth that are small or non-existent, and hind teeth that are very broad for grinding up leaves and grasses. At one point, the parasodactyl species were numerous and widespread, existing almost everywhere except Australia, and of course, Antarctica. Over the last period of the Cenozoic era, many of these parasodactyl lineages started to die out, suffering from habitat loss and competition with other species. Today, the parasodactyls live in isolated communities scattered across the world, in pockets in East and South Africa, the Central Americas, and South Central Asia. The tapirs and the rhinos are particularly vulnerable, as their populations are decimated by habitat loss and poaching. Horses and donkeys, however, have secured their place in evolutionary history for the time being, having been domesticated by humans and reintroduced to virtually every region of the world. So these parasodactyls lived and thrived during the Neogene, grazing and moving about on the emergent grasslands and savannas. These biomes were more suited to the drier conditions that characterized the Neogene, 
and they continued to push back the forests into the more humid regions. This happened all over the world, back and forth in a two-step forward, one-step back cycle, on a trend towards greater aridity. This trend was so strong that, for a while, and by a while I mean a couple million years, but for a while there, the Mediterranean Sea had dried up. It evaporated. Right next door, the Arabian Peninsula emerged as a continental highland, draining much of the water out of the region and increasing the aridity tremendously. As biomes like savannas spread throughout the northern heart of Africa, the Sahara Desert began to form. A hugely important thing happened during this time period that I discussed in the episode about human evolution. Our primate ancestors lived in the forests of East Africa, but as the world dried out during the Neogene, these forests thinned and shrank back to more humid, hospitable regions. Instead of migrating with the receding forests, the ancestors of the human species came down from the trees. They moved out of the jungles and emerged onto the hot, dry, grassland plains of the African savanna. This human ancestor was called Homo ergaster, and it would go on to produce divergent lineages called Homo erectus and Homo antecessor. The species Homo erectus would persist for about one and a half million years before going extinct, while the species Homo antecessor would undergo another divergence. This divergence produced the Homo rodensiensis and the Homo neanderthalensis, also known as the Neanderthals. So at the beginning of the Cenozoic, at the very start of the Paleogene, the world was cold and dark, about to recover from the meteor impact that caused the KT extinction. During the mid-Paleogene, the Earth had warmed significantly, and for that matter, it was really humid. Jungles had regrown and carpeted the planet, reaching up close to the poles. But then, the trend reversed, as all of this CO2 was absorbed in the plants and the Earth started to cool off. This cooling was gradual, until we came to the mid to late Paleogene, where there was a brief cold snap, the temperature plunged, and this cold snap killed a huge chunk of life on Earth. Despite ecosystems and life in general recovering after this extinction, the Earth continued on this trend of cooling, and becoming increasingly more arid. Now, we're three million years ago, at the end of the Neogene, and at the beginning of the final period in the Cenozoic Era, a period called the Quaternary. The Quaternary is split unevenly into two smaller chunks of time. The first chunk of time is called the Pleistocene, and it composes pretty much 99.6% of the Quaternary period. So as far as today's episode is concerned, the Pleistocene might as well be synonymous with Quaternary because it covers virtually the same exact amount of time. But that second chunk of time, that 0.4% of the Quaternary, is called the Holocene, and it's only lasted for the last 11,700 years, which is extremely recent, geologically speaking. For much of the early Pleistocene, the cooling trend continued into a series of ice ages. In fact, the Earth was enveloped in four ice ages during this period, with each one producing glaciers that reached as far south as 40 degrees latitude. That's as far from the North Pole as New York, Madrid, Rome, and Tokyo. Meanwhile, in Africa, the increasing aridity had inflamed the Sahara Desert to its current mammoth size, and it also led to the creation of the Namib and the Kalahari Deserts. Recall how in the early Mesozoic, all of the land masses of the Earth had merged into a single supercontinent called Pangaea. The coastal regions of Pangaea were near the oceans, where the ocean water regulated their climates. Because of this thermal regulation, the coasts never got particularly hot or particularly cold. But far from the coasts, and deep inside the continental heart of Pangaea, far from any major lakes or oceans, the climate could undergo huge temperature shifts. These intercontinental regions were very dry, and as the air had so little moisture, they couldn't hold on to any heat. So during the day, these regions would get really hot under the eye of the sun. 
But because there was no moisture in the air, there was nothing to hold on to this heat. And so during the evening and at night, it would get really cold, because all the heat would dissipate away. But more than that, these intercontinental regions also had really cold winters and really hot summers. These seasonal temperature swings were huge, and there wasn't much life, plant or animal, that could withstand these seasonal extremes. Now, coming back to where we were in evolutionary history during the Cenozoic era, the increasing planetary aridity seemed to induce this kind of temperature shift on the entire planet. Entire regions were being pushed to the extremes. Forests were pushed back by grassland, and grassland dried up into savanna before giving way to desert. This happened not only in Africa, but in Central Asia and North America as well, where temperate rainforests in the central continental regions gave way to grasslands. Some of these grasslands remained as prairie, but near Mexico it dried up into savanna and desert. In the higher latitudes, the dryness mopped up the forests and replaced them with more grasslands, only for those to turn into tundra, as repeated glaciation events and a cooling climate permanently froze the ground and made it too difficult for even most species of grasses to grow here. The predominant vegetation here became hardy coniferous plants and lichen. This was a period of great geological and meteorological change, so it should be no surprise that it was a time of great evolutionary change as well. Even though the Pleistocene is a relatively short time period, its climate has been relatively harsher and less stable than that of previous eras, which puts selective pressure on all the organisms living through it. In the northern parts of the world, woolly mammoths and mastodons appeared and radiated. Elsewhere, predators like dire wolves and saber-toothed tigers roamed the grasslands in search of food. Out there in the grasslands and savannas, hunting all of these creatures for food and furs were the Homo sapiens, a recent emergence on the world stage. Remember the hominid group Homo ergaster? They diverged to produce Homo erectus and the Homo antecessor. Erectus would exist for about a million and a half years before going extinct, while Antecessor would diverge into the Neanderthals and the Homo rodensiensis. The Neanderthals would largely move out of Africa and into Europe and northwestern Asia, while the Homo rodensiensis stayed in Africa. About 200 to 300,000 years ago, at the very tail end of the Pleistocene, a population of Homo rodensiensis undergoing speciation became the Homo sapiens, evolving into the physiological form of the modern human being. These Homo sapiens would spread out across the plains and forests of Africa, and then move northward into Eurasia. Some groups went north into Europe, where they would meet the Neanderthals and, for some time, interbreed, before eventually outcompeting them into extinction. Other groups went further east into Asia, across the Arabian Peninsula, India, and Central Asia. Some groups made it across the continent to the eastern coasts of Asia, where they migrated northward into Siberia and Kamchatka. Glaciation had bound up a lot of water in the polar ice caps, so the sea level was much lower and the Bering Land Bridge was exposed. This is a huge expanse of low-lying land that sits between Alaska and Russia. Today, the Bering Land Bridge is entirely submerged under the Bering Strait, but 20,000 years ago, it was a huge expanse of flat, dry land. Our human ancestors moved in bulk across this land bridge to settle North America. They moved southwards, crossing the northern continent and passing through the Panama Isthmus to South America. I want to talk about the Panama Isthmus for a moment because it's actually really important. The isthmus is like a land bridge, a particularly narrow land bridge, which connects two giant landmasses full of diverse flora and fauna. Before the land bridge formed, North and South America were isolated landmasses. For millions of years, the species who lived on each continent had evolved and diverged from their cousin lineages who lived on the other continent. This made North and South America 
kind of like evolutionary petri dishes, where a few native species were like the first bacteria in a petri dish, and the hundreds and thousands of their descendant species are like the huge complex bacterial colony that grows in the isolated petri dish. With that said, when the Panama Isthmus formed around 3 million years ago, it created a literal bridge between these two landmasses. For a moment, the petri dishes were touching, and the result was cross-contamination. In less metaphorical terms, the land bridge provided a corridor through which mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, arthropods, and even plants of all sorts could physically move to the other continent. This led to an event called the Great American Biotic Interchange, as huge numbers of North American species migrated into South America and vice versa. Some creatures from North America that migrated south include ungulate lineages like horses and deer, carnivoran lineages like bears, wolves, and cats, and rodents. Creatures from South America that migrated north came from lineages like the ground sloths and the last of the giant birds, as well as armadillo-like creatures called glyptodonts and a few species of capybara. Unfortunately for most of these migrating animals, they found themselves unable to compete in their new habitats as well as the species who had lived there for millions of years. The species that migrated to the north had a particularly rough go of it because the climate was pretty tough, but the species moving south had considerably more luck, as they were moving into regions that were warmer and more humid and with more stable climates. The species that had moved north were not as lucky, as they were migrating into a harsher and more unforgiving climate than the one that they were used to. This led to a differential success between the groups, where those that migrated south tended to adapt and radiate with more effectiveness than those who migrated north. Most of the large animals that migrated to the north ended up going extinct, being outcompeted by other inhabitants, or being killed by the weather but the smaller animals were particularly successful. Some of these creatures whose ancestors came up during the Great Interchange are the armadillos and the porcupines. Now there were some rodents who migrated from North America to South America, and these were wildly successful, diverging and radiating into over 80 different genera in the fertile South American wilderness. It should be noted that while the Panama Isthmus enabled this great exchange of life between the continents, it did the exact opposite for the oceans. The Panama Isthmus split an ocean in half, and you can see this in the biology of the marine life in the area. If you look at the genomes of various fish and marine plants on the west and east coasts of Central America, you'll see that they started diverging after experiencing allopatric isolation from this isthmus. It started when the land bridge emerged and split the aquatic biome down the middle. The late Cenozoic era was characterized by waves of glaciation events that would come and freeze the Earth for thousands of years, only to melt during rewarming periods characterized by greater humidity and higher sea levels. The Pleistocene came to an end with the last of the glaciation events which occurred about 11,700 years ago. In the beginning of this interval of rewarming, which is still ongoing today, Homo sapiens developed agriculture. We figured out the basics of stone tools for something close to 3 million years, even predating the existence of Homo sapiens themselves. And our ancestors also figured out how to control fire. The technological development of the human species has been an accelerating process. It started out pretty slowly, with one discovery there or an invention here, but over time it adds up, and we build a sort of technological momentum. We learn more and then invent more stuff, and then we learn more and invent more stuff with the previous inventions, and so on and so forth. In the blink of a geologic eye, those savanna dwelling proto humans went from tinkering with rocks and fire to communicating instantaneously across the planet and sending spaceships to the moon. All of our complex society, all of our technology, all of our ways of life, literally everything that's cultural and not genetic, 
developed in the Holocene, in these most recent 10,000 years of human existence. But I'll get to this in the next episode. Alright, so that is about it. That's the story of life on Earth. I might have left out a few details here and there, but if I were to include everything, like as many extinct species and migration routes and extinction events and glaciation events and everything else that happened during the Earth's history, this series would be a thousand hours long. I had to keep it short, so I hope you enjoyed what you got. This series was particularly fun for me to research and write, but it's not over yet, because in the next episode, I'm going to take a more in-depth look at the Holocene, and we'll be exploring the ecology and biology of the world of ancient man. So if you enjoyed this episode, give it a like and share it with your friends and classmates. And if that next episode sounds interesting, then hit the subscribe button so you won't miss it. And as always, thanks for listening.